All right, this is a the start of a new video series uh, responding to Russ Miller, a an hour and a half long video he made called uh, 50 Facts Against Darwinism or something like that along those lines. Um, links to it will be down below. Uh, when, before I start, though, I kind of want a little bit of an introduction. Now, you guys might remember I responded to Russ Miller in a video series I did uh, on, from his appearance on Carl Bow's television show. He had an episode called Facts vs. Darwin. And from that, apparently, before I even put that one out, I would corresponded with him via email and PMs. Um, and not very fruitfully, in my opinion. He's kind of rude. In my, I, I think he's kind of rude. And I know he could probably say, well, you were rude to me in that video and all of that. And he'd probably have a valid point. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, he found the videos, the responses that I'd made, and responded with, as typical, I'm going to get into this a little bit, as typical, you know, right off the bat, he goes something about calling me a liar, the last, ba lame calling is the last bastion of whatever, uh, implying that I called him a name because I don't have any arguments, I couldn't refute anything he said, so I just called him names. Which, as you guys ever, if you guys recall, my six part, six part video, um, I did a little bit more than call them names in that. Um, I'm not even positive that I called him a liar in that, and if I did, it's well-deserved. He's a liar. Um, but that aside, uh, I don't know, providing actual reference to, you know, referencing the claims that he made from the actual sources he claims to cite, uh, showing current understanding, showing the models that he presents as incorrect, all of that. But no, 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 no. I called him a liar, so therefore we can scrub the whole rest of the series. We don't have to listen to it, right? Um, anyway, it's that typical bullshit that these guys like to do. Um, and then he got into... A lot of the stuff from that video, unfortunately, I'm going to have to recover in this video because it's the same material. Now, this video was made in uh, it was May 2008, the video that I'm responding to. So again, keeping fair, I'm not going to hold him to any information from, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. Only information discovered prior to 2008 will I hold him accountable for in terms of keeping current on scientific discoveries. I think that's only fair. It's important to realize that these are both religious beliefs. I think about this logically. We're taught in school today, and our kids are taught, that Darwinian evolution is science, and that biblical creation is a religious belief. But aren't they both philosophies and how we came about? Aren't they both about our origins? Aren't they both exactly the same thing? Exactly the same thing. So because because uh, the theory of evolution or or you know sciences of origin, sciences of history, uh, deal with the, the beginnings of things. Therefore, they're exactly the same as a creation story. Um, they're exactly the same. No more, no less support. No more, no less philosophical, intellectual weight can be put behind them, right? So that means that, okay, now, my parents told me, my parents informed me that I was the product of a sexual, sexual union between them, okay? Um, that I gestated for nine months, was born into the world, um, no memories at that point, spent approximately a year as an infant, uh, started toddling about, spent the next four years, um, I don't remember very much of those years, maybe brief memories here and there, started school when I was five, and so on, right? Now that's what, I, that's what I, my parents told me. But you know what? I believe that this is all an illusion, living in an imaginary construct, and that I, I did not exist before last Thursday. And you know what? Those two concepts have equal weight, right? Because they're both philosophies of origin, right? So they're, therefore they're equal. Is that, is that logical to you? Oh, by the way, I should mention here, in order to calibrate my response, I've developed something I like to call the Goldilocks Ponage Meter. Um, that'll let me know, you know, if, this is, if it's too much or too little or whatever, all right? So uh, just go on to the next clip. So we're going to talk about the religious belief of Darwinian evolution tonight. In the 1971 foreword to Darwin's uh, book, the reprint, it states that belief in evolution is exactly parallel to belief in special creation. 
So you're going to quote, you're, you're going to cite the 1971, Harrison Mitchell's 1971 introduction to Origin of Species and make the claim that he supports your contention that evolution and creation are exactly the same kinds of philosophies. Well, you know what I, th I say? I say that makes you a worthless, loser, douchebag, piece of shit, fucktarded, I hope you fucking die of ass cancer. This ponage is too hot. So you're citing Harrison Mitchell's 1971 intro, introduction to the origin of species. Well, I'm not entirely sure that you're being honest with how you're reflecting that quote or with how you're reporting that quote. This ponage is too cold. All right, so you cite Harrison Mitchell's introduction to origin of species from 1971. Well, just so happens, not all of us have to take your word on what that says. This ponage is just right. Let's see, now what, what was it that you wrote here? Um, which, which portion of it did you cite? Evolution is thus exactly parallel to belief in special creation. Now is that the whole quote? Is that what Mr. Mitchell meant? Dr. Mitchell meant when he wrote that? Honestly, look inside yourself and you tell me, did he mean, is that what he meant? Was he trying to say that evolution and creation are exactly the same kind of philosophy? Was that what he was saying? Well, let's read the rest of what he wrote. How about that? Wouldn't that be fun? The fact of evolution is the backbone of biology. Biology is thus in the peculiar position of being a science founded on an unproven theory. Is it then science or a faith? Belief in the theory of evolution is thus exactly parallel to a belief in special creation, as both are concepts which believers know to be true, but neither, up to, up to the present, has been capable of proof. Okay? Now, you might say that's exactly the same thing. Well, you're a f douchebag. Um, because what he's talking about, he talks about, he, said, he states throughout this introduction that evolution is a proven fact. What he's specifically talking about is the, the theory, okay, natural selection, Darwin's theory, which is what Darwinism is, natural selection. Um, not your straw man, we'll get into that later on. Um, he's talking about natural selection, the theory of not being proven. Now, I'm not going to make it really clear here. I don't exactly agree with what Harrison Mitchell's saying either in this section because of the fact that he's, he's, he states that a theory can be proven, um, which is simply false. But now just, just I'm, I'm going to look on just, uh, just oh, the very next page just to see now, now does Harrison Mitchell disbelieve Darwin's theory of natural selection? Does he, does he believe that, oh, young earth creationism is equally a valid theory? Well, let's see. What does he say? During the last 50 years, genetics has unraveled many of the extremely complex phenomena of inheritance and shown that evolution by natural selection of random mutations, generally of small size, is a logical explanation of the origin of the immense array of organisms now and in the past living on Earth. The theory is so plausible that most biologists accept it as though it were a proven fact, although their conviction rests upon circumstantial evidence, it forms a satisfactory faith upon which to base our interpretations of nature. So does it sound to you that he doubts it like you're claiming? Tell me. You have to have faith in either one because there, we're talking about events of the past that aren't there to test, study, and observe today. You can take evidences that, that you can observe today and try to extrapolate them backwards, but you can't actually test the past. So we can't test the past. That's right. We can't. We we. It's absolutely true. We cannot go and actually physically observe something that's already happened. All right, you caught us. Um, so what does that mean? Um, you state that evidences of the things that we observe now can be applied to the past. Also, things that leave their trace. We can form hypotheses and theories based upon things that happened in the past and then develop tests to see whether or not those are plausible explanations. That's what evolution's done. Well, if Darwinian evolution is true, then there should be undeniable evidences. They should have literally hundreds of millions of undeniable pieces of evidence showing that evolution took place from a Darwinian macro scale. Yeah, millions of evidences. If only we had millions of evidences. Oh, wait, we do. Okay. The fact of the matter is, there's not one 
observation that's made in biology and paleontology and geology that doesn't support an old earth where you're getting that there's none is well it, how about this there's no just like I, it, there's no evidences there's not millions of evidences there's no evidences that you will actually look at that you will actually listen to that you will actually try to understand on even the most fundamental high school level okay that's what you're saying when you say there's no evidence and the Bible tells us to prove all things and to hold fast to that which is good. So let's take a look at some science versus the teachings in the humanistic owned textbooks about Darwinian evolution. So it's interesting that you quote mine your own holy book, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Now, that's interesting to me because if you look at the verses before and after that, it's specifically talking about spirituality. It's, it's specifically talking about the prophets and your spiritual relationship with God, not talking about looking at scientific evidences for the origin of the world. And in fact, in, in looking at my Bible concordance, it directly pointed me to another verse. Let's see here. 1 John 4, 1 through 3, which is kind of a restating of that same point, talking about how to, how to test the words of the prophet how to prove the words of the prophet because if they don't glorify the one and only son of God as your only source of salvation then they're to be rejected so any prophet that doesn't say that is therefore a false prophet that's what that verse is referring to it's not talking about weighing scientific evidence I mean the, the, the distinction may be minor but again I wouldn't I why should I be surprised that you would quote mine your own book Let's look at the first law of thermodynamics, the law of conservation of mass and energy, which basically states that matter and or energy cannot be created or destroyed. So I have to ask the evolutionists, where did the energy come from to power my laptop or the lights in this building or to spin the planet or to power the sun or the stars throughout the universe? Where did the energy come from? Well, let's go back to a college science book for a uh, scientific explanation. It says, well, in the beginning, all the energy was condensed into an inconceivably tiny speck. The laws of physics can't account for this. So this is pretty interesting. You cite from Dr. You quote from Dr. Fetter's um, Human Antiquity. But the big question I have, now here's the question. Why did you consult um, a book on archaeology, an archaeology textbook, when you're asking questions about physics? Uh, cosmology, the origin of the universe. It's kind of an interesting. Why didn't you go to a physics text or a cosmology or even an astronomy text? Why not go to a text that's actually relevant to the question you're asking? I, I'm just curious. So I thought to myself, now this is irrelevant. This has nothing to do with this discussion, okay? Um, that this has nothing to do with Miller's video here. I'm, I'm merely, I had this unrelated question that it reminded me of. I want to know, what do modern, current, Biblical literalists, apologists, what do they believe about the historical accuracy of the Old Testament? What do they believe about it? What, what, what does Lee Strobel, what, what do the leaders in, in Christian apologetics believe about the historical accuracy of the Old Testament? So I wanted to answer that question. So I thought, you know, what a, a good place to go is Dr. Fetter's Human Antiquities textbook. That's a great place to look for such information um, and, see, and to find out what this is. And I found, uh, this is what he writes. When the so-called Babylonian captivity ended in the 6th century BC, the Jews needed to re-establish their uniqueness and identity and to formalize their history and cultural heritage. To help accomplish this goal, the old writings were edited, removing their internal contradictions and adding some of the history that had, been take that had taken place since. Also added was the account of a six-day creation from an all-powerful god, taken largely from the then-popular Babylonian myth called the Enuma Elish. Well, so that's what... I, that's interesting, Miller. I didn't know that. So that's what you guys believe about the historical accuracy of the Bible. That's good to know. Um, I, you know, I don't have time to keep up on on apologetics or even even theology. So it's good to know that's what you guys, your, your current view on the subject is. 